Hello, everyone. Welcome. Dr. Cheryl Casey is a scholar and public speaker in media, culture, and communication. She spent over two decades teaching college courses in media and information literacy, digital culture, and communication ethics. After many years in the classroom advocating for the importance of local journalism, Cheryl now focuses on reporting local news while pursuing a master's degree in legal studies at Northeastern University School of Law. Cheryl holds a PhD and MA in media and culture from NYU and a BA in media studies from Sacred Heart University. In addition to publishing scholar, scholarly articles and contributing book chapters, Cheryl has co-authored two textbooks in media studies, including Navigating the Information Landscape, a multidisciplinary approach to media and information literacy, just released this past summer by Cognella Publishing. She's also passionate about history, serving as president of the Waterbury Historical Society. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Cheryl Casey. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you for having me here today. I'm excited if not a little bit exhausted to talk about this topic. It's been a long election season. I don't know how you all feel about it. Um, but when it comes to information, I'm going to take a wild guess that we all grew up in the age of broadcasting, television and radio. These were our information environments, which means we developed from the start, a set of information literacy skills that work in that environment, right? that align with the skills called upon in that environment. And so when we think about media change, communication change, every revolution in human history in communication called for new and different kinds of information literacy skills. So if we just take a look at a very broad, sweeping timeline of, of human history here, um, from when we first started carving symbols, etchings into, um, into stone, into clay, on the side of cave walls, all the way through what we call oral culture, where, where information, we have language, but we store the information we produce with language primarily in our heads, which means our key skills are memory and thinking memorable thoughts. Everything else? Nope, don't want it, right? All the way through to understanding how to really engage with images as we also have language. Right, and the power of the image on the television screen, on the film screen, right, and how to interpret those visual messages alongside the words being used. Right? And so now we have digital. Okay. And so um, my goal here today, and I'm, I'm, so, I'm so excited for the, the timing of, of all of this, because the, um, the last few months have been just an information glut, <laughs> which I guess pretty much has been the last decade or so with the internet and social media and so forth, right? So in terms of developing our information literacy skills, first of all, this is supposed to be hard because we have to shift gears sort of in the middle of our lives, no other generation in human history has really had to change their literacy skills so quickly. Until the 20th century, media change, communication change, information management moved very slowly, very slowly. The printing press was essentially the same physical technology mechanism for 400 years before the application of steam power. Right? So, so cognitively, those of us 
who grew up learning an entirely different set of information skills in an entirely different set, in an entirely different information environment, are supposed to be finding this hard. It's not second nature to us, like it might be to those born into this environment. Right? Certainly, they start learning those skills earlier and internalizing those skills earlier, one would hope. We need to advocate for media literacy education starting in the elementary schools. There's my plug. Um, <laughs> so, um, so a few years ago when I was um, at Champlain College and the college started adjusting some of its first year curriculum to think more about what are the practical but also theoretical skills and knowledge that our first year students um, really should be developing as soon as they get to college. Um, some colleagues and I decided that, you know, this is a vast, vast terrain. And to work with a bunch of students for one semester, 15 weeks on, on developing these kinds of skills, we're like, you know what, there's pretty much no way. And there wasn't a textbook out there. There wasn't a single or even a couple of books that sort of addressed, all right, if on my wish list of five things students would take away from an introductory information skills um, course, what would those be? Let's write the book that does that. Um, and so, and so we, did, we did spend two years on, on this labor of love, which was happily finally published. Over, over the, the summer. I'm not plugging the book, it's a textbook. You probably don't want to read a textbook. Um, <laughs> but but it, does, it does mean that I've, I've spent the last few years really thinking deeply about the importance of information literacy and how to just grab onto some key principles, key concepts, key habits to survive and maybe even thrive just a little bit in this information environment. So my goals today, as I said, this is a huge area. So I'm really only going to be able to hit on some, some highlights, some key points that I think are relevant to our, our everyday information lives. First, establish some key terms, which might feel very simplistic. But um, it's really important in the everyday talk about information, about what is fact, what is opinion, um, what is true, what is false. I think that some of this language, some of these terms get thrown around without any critical understanding or thought about what they mean. So it's important to establish we're on the same page of, of concepts. Right? We're going to then look at some examples and definitions of what we mean by misinformation and disinformation. They are not mutually exclusive, but they are different. Um, I have some examples for you, which could be fun. Um, and, and also consider implications for, for the future. When we think about the information landscape, um, communication and, and media literacy scholars will, will often carve up communication history into what we call um, information or communication revolutions. And these are like the historically sweeping, culture changing uh, innovations in, in communication. And so we start with oral culture, we then develop writing, then there's printing, then there's broadcast for major information revolutions. And we are in the middle of the, the fifth, the, the digital information, the, the digital networked information revolution. Um, and some might argue, and my suggestion is that with the development of AI, that is not just an evolutionary aspect of the digital revolution, but could be prompting another major revolution with existential, human existential um, implications to it. So, um, Lots to think about. Okay, basically, we start with information itself. What is information? And it's worth parsing that out because information is what we do with facts. 
and facts are our data. So what we observe, what we measure, um, what we sort of calculate. Right? We can count the number of people in the room here who are, who are present. And that gives us data. That number is our data. That data is factual because we can verify it. Somebody else can also count. We can have five people do a head count. Right? And we should be able to come up with the same number of heads in the room. Right? That is fact. That is data. Right? But what does, but, but so what? What does that mean? What do we do with that? Right? That's where we turn that data into information. We put that data into context. We make some meaning out of it. Right? And so with the number of people in the room, we can put it in context and say, well, that, you know, other speakers had more people in the room, so maybe this isn't as interesting. Right? <laughs> like, you, you don't know what the facts mean until you put them in context. And that is information that we can work with. Right? That's key. The other key distinction is that between fact and opinion. Okay? As I just said, facts are verifiable. They are observable. They are supported with evidence. They can be shown to, um, they can be validated or invalidated. I can have trouble counting and somebody can say, no, your number is wrong. I invalidate your count by, by adding our media guy. Right? Because I didn't count him in the audience because he has to be here. Right? So, um, so facts are observable. Opinions are expressions of attitudes, of beliefs. Opinions are viewpoints. Opinions cannot be verified or proven. They're not opposites. They work together because opinions are one of the ways that we make meaning from facts. So, fact, I have eaten lima beans before in my life. Opinion, gross. <laughs> right? Um, so, so, that difference is so important because today in our information environment in particular, right, so many public figures are trying to say that opinions are masquerading as, or facts are masquerading as opinions. Other, opinions are masquerading as facts. Thank you. <laughs> that was, that's actually a slide number nine, um, <laughs> which I'll say it correctly. Um, and so when it comes to information, there's always been problematic information. Um, information that is false, that is sensational, that is misleading, that is manipulative. We can look throughout history to the epic poems of the ancient world, which was kind of basically propaganda, right, for telling a certain story about a civilization's identity, as well as moral lessons with regards to what behaviors will and will not be punished or rewarded by the gods, by the authority voice in the world. Um, in Italy in 1475, um, a group of about a dozen Jewish citizens of a small town were burned at the stake because of rumors that they were responsible for the death of an infant and that the infant's blood was used in some sort of sacrificial ritual. Right? Rumors. Benjamin Franklin, who we sometimes refer to as our first media mogul, because he owned lots of papers and he wielded his power with those papers. He would intentionally print false stories about the indigenous peoples doing horrible things 
and in particular being in league with King George III in order to stoke revolutionary sentiment. And he's like our newspaper guy in history. Right? We like him. <laughs> um, but he peddled in fake news with the best of them. Um, and then even in the 20th century, we can look to um, World War I and World War II propaganda, for example, as, as misleading, as manipulative, as sensational and incomplete, if not false, information. Right? So facts are labeled as, as opinions in masquerade. And this is where we run into a lot of trouble in our contemporary information environment because we're not stopping to think about the difference between facts and opinion and the fact that they are not opposites. Okay, it's like if something is not a fact, it must be an opinion. No, it could just be like bad data. Um, something that's an opinion can still be based on, informed by facts, a meaning made out of facts, of data that you then interpret for your own. That distinction gets lost. That, is, that distinction has been lost and buried. Right? We need to dig that up. Um, that distinction being lost is a key reason why we have such a problem today. An exacerbated, accelerated, more widespread problem with misinformation and disinformation than ever before in human history. And so the differences between these two is about how it is produced with what intent. Is it intent to harm or not? Misinformation is false information that is spread regardless of intent, right? And often spread unknowingly that it is false. So reporter errors, and journalists make mistakes. They're human. It doesn't mean they are trying to mess with the facts or tell lies or create fake news. They do mess up. Um, satire, rumors. Misunderstanding the original message. These are all examples of misinformation that any one of us in this room might unwittingly convey to others, spread to others. Okay. And we might believe it to be true, but we kind of just got it wrong. We can all be distributors. We can all be victims of misinformation. As if misinformation isn't dangerous enough then we have the kind of information that is deliberately misleading, deliberately false, created with the intent to obscure the truth. Hoaxes, conspiracy theories, propaganda. Propaganda, by definition, is not about truth or data. It is about emotion. Fake news. Okay, so when Benjamin Franklin published stories about um, you know, the certain indigenous peoples being in league with King George III, he was making it up. That's disinformation. Often disinformation is cloaked within um, a familiar context, so it seems to make sense. It's structured in a familiar way, so it's easy to digest. It can mimic legitimate information. So not all information is disinformation, but all disinformation is misinformation. Right, so disinformation is that intentionally produced false content. Um, and that's where, that's where, in particular, fact and opinion are intentionally blurred. 
So if we think about the different categories of myths and disinformation that we encounter on a, a regular basis, we have satire or, or parody. If you're a fan of Saturday Night Live, if you watch any of the late night comics, if you're a fan of Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, which I am obsessed with, um, this is a lot of satire, parody, making fun. Right? However much research and facts are used to inform or not used to inform the parody or the satire. Right? But that's on the lower end of danger because it's generally signaled that it's a satire, that it's a parody. So we know it's not supposed to be taken seriously. False connections um, where, have you ever read a headline and then clicked on the headline and found that the rest of the story is far more banal than what the headline promised? Yeah, when elements of a message don't really line up in, um, in a relevant way, right? Something about the headlines, the visuals, or captions to an image don't actually support the content, the meat of the message. Our information can be misleading. It might have factual information. Right? There might not be anything you can prove false, but it might be, say, lacking context, or it might be presented in a particular way. Um, this is called framing, and we'll look at an example of that in a little bit. But, uh, but information might be framed in a particular way where like, some of the facts are conveniently left out, which then encourages one interpretation one set of meanings over another potential set of meanings. So it's always worth asking, like, what's actually outside the frame? Right? Just think about a picture frame. What is happening in that image that didn't make it framed by the camera? Right? There's always something in our information. Um, false context. So this would take the genuine, genuine truth and divorce it from the original context. Imposter content, genuine sources are impersonated. Has anyone ever received an email that pretends to be from Amazon about your account? And it's not really, but it looks awfully legit. This is imposter content. And this is on, on the more dangerous side of the misinformation continuum because that's where they start getting your money and other personal information. Right. The dangers, low danger, high danger, has to do with consequences, with implications. Manipulated content that is genuine content, but manipulated to deceive. And then fabricated content that's the entirely 100% false created intentionally to deceive and to harm. So why do people do this? Why do so many people intentionally spend their time creating false information? Why did Benjamin Franklin spend his time publishing fake stories? Number one reason, money gets a lot of clicks, sells a lot of papers. It's very sensational. It catches our attention. And even if we recognize it as false, we've already clicked and the money's already made. There might be a political agenda or some other kind of agenda related to power, power dynamics. Right? People do it as a joke, sometimes without thinking through the dangers of that joke. And people do it 
in order to intentionally hurt other people, specific people, to target people. So if we are looking to up our game, to level up in spotting misinformation and disinformation, I would recommend one place to go is factcheck.org. They are um, they're based out of University of Pennsylvania at the Annenberg Public Policy Center. They, they are research-based, they are nonpartisan, um, and their entire mission is to take what people are saying in public forums, particularly in the news, and to go line by line, fact check, right, and verify the data. Um, and so these are just two examples of, of articles or of issues that, that are reported on or spoken about frequently that they've, that they've done some, some fact checking on. Another tool you can use is what we call the crap test. My, my doctoral dissertation um, advisor um, would constantly tell us that he was all about honing our crap detectors. So first is ask this piece of information. How timely is the information and is recent information required? How does the information relate to your question in terms of maybe what you want to know about? If you're looking, if you're actively seeking for information to answer a particular question, maybe about what are the candidates' different positions on, on the issue of school funding. That's been a, that's been a local, um, local as in Vermont, um, very hot topic in this election season. How does the information that you found relate to your question, and how does it relate to other sources? Because yes, we need to look at more than one source. Who is the source? What are their credentials or their affiliation? What's the URL you're going to? If it's a .com, not as credible as a .edu or a .gov, .org, you want to look at the About Us for whatever the organization is that's publishing it, because sometimes they are partisan think tanks. How reliable is their evidence? Does the evidence connect to the claims that are being made? Or is the evidence spurious? Is there like, I don't really see how you get there. And what's the purpose of the information? Why did somebody create this content? Is that content presenting facts, or is that content presenting commentary? And this is something that we want to think about, especially when it comes to our news organizations, because news organizations have commentary and opinion editorial sections, or departments, or programs. Fox News, CNN, okay, these are two examples of a lot of commentary programs. But they also both have legitimate news divisions. And so it's important to be able to recognize why, why is this program on this channel or, or this section of CNN's website giving me this kind of com content? Is it to analyze, unpack, comment, or is it to inform? So we can apply some of these crap criteria to a lot of different kinds of information to include email scams, which I'm sure every one of us in this room has gotten an email that is a scam at one point or another. Some key things to look for to never be scammed. First, look at how they address you. Is it generic? Is it just, hi? 
Red flag. Do they request personal information? None of our subscriptions, accounts, and so forth will request personal information using email. We go into their websites and sign into our accounts. We go to the app and sign into our accounts. That's where we put our personal information in order to pay, renew our subscription, purchase our dog food. We're not asked to do that via email. Do they give a nice, clear, big, shiny button to lure you there? Red flag number three. Um, hyperlinks, whether it's in the text or on the, on the button itself, if you hover, and this will depend on uh, maybe which operating system that you're working on or, or what kind of device, but if you just hover your mouse over the link, you should get a preview of what the, link, what the address is in the bottom left, bottom left corner of your screen. And you'll see it's not going, and it's not here in the picture, um, but when you hover, you'll see that that link is not actually going to Netflix or Amazon or your bank. It's going somewhere else. Right? And you don't, want, you don't want to click that. If there are unsolicited attachments, also not good. Look at the email address that it's coming from. A lot of these scams will create email addresses that look similar to, say, Netflix. But then, but it's not really. It, it'll actually be different, and you sometimes have to look closely to see that it actually says maybe Netflix3.com. That's not Netflix.com. That's Netflix3.com, which is something else entirely. We don't know what it is, and we don't want to know. So look at the email address. Right. And then if there are spelling and grammar mistakes, seriously. <laughs> Our, the institutions, organizations, and services to which we give our money for something in return should at the very least know how to spell check. Okay, and if they're not doing that, unsubscribe. This is an example of an email that I personally received just the other week. From the name of an actual friend with a legitimate looking email address. GMAVT.net. I have friends who, who also use that, that email service. I've never emailed her. We've never emailed back and forth before. I don't have her email address in my contacts. Our only communications, if not in person, happen via text or via Facebook Messenger. So right away, receiving an email from her should give me pause. Catch up. Well, often when we start texting each other, it's because we haven't caught up in a while. So that makes it seem legitimate. And so I did click on it to open it, even though I thought, why is Chrissy emailing me? So I clicked on it. And lo and behold, no personal greeting, content that doesn't have anything to do with the subject line, a misspelling, none of that makes sense. So my crap detector is just blaring. Fake, 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 scam, scam, scam. And after taking the screenshot, sent it to spam. These things happen every day. So if you're going to successfully navigate any information, whether it be in the news, whether it be on social media, in your feeds, in, um, in personal conversations, or on television, the first thing we need to do is recognize our biases. Because what we like to do, what we do as humans, is have opinions. It's impossible for us to achieve pure unbiased. 
We are always seeing the world through our own frames of reference. And when we talk about a frame, we're talking about what's inside that frame as well as what's outside, what's not included in how we see the world. So what's really important is that we recognize how we're inclined to make meaning of what we observe, make meaning of facts, of the data we are taking in as we move through the world. Right? We prefer certain ways of interpreting the world, but preference also implies evaluation and judgment, implies that one way of seeing the world is better than another way of seeing the world. Right? So how we see the world affects how we make meaning of any information, either explicitly or implicitly. The preferences, the biases that kind of fly under our radar because thinking that way is just so normal to us. It's just so everyday. It's just so common sense. And I use those quote marks intentionally because common sense is just a learned and broadly accepted way of looking at the world and how it works. And the biggest danger or um, biggest hurdle to overcome when navigating information is confirmation bias. Because it's really comfortable to hone in on information that supports what we already believe. It is not fun to have your worldview upended. Confirmation bias is deeply entrenched. It is internalized. It is learned, and it is connected to emotions. So we end up unwittingly plugging our ears to anything that doesn't match what we already believe, which is a real problem if we're trying to ascertain the quality of resources. It means we have to be able to open our perspective to a variety of interpretations and facts in order to arrive at something that's credible. Um, allsides.com is another resource that I would recommend for just understanding how a lot of our news sources are either implicitly or explicitly biased, showing preference for, and they, they have, um, they label articles with left, center, and right. So, um, you know, they make these charts and help give us a sense of what's the perspective, whether what they're printing is disinformation or just presented in a particular way with all the appropriate facts. Right? This is the framework that each of these use. Right? So framing just means selecting, emphasizing, and presenting information in a way that helps to make sense for the audience. And in making sense, we're encouraging a particular interpretation. One rather famous example in media analysis and media criticism courses of different ways to frame a significant issue happened back in the 90s with the arrest of O.J. Simpson. And these two very different magazine covers featuring the same photo. There's nothing false about it. But these are two different framings that definitely incline towards different kinds of interpretations. 
Other ways we can consider framing is in looking not just at visuals, at actual framed pictures, but in looking at the language that's used. Same event, same topic, three different headlines. And these are all, like Fox News, their news division, CNN, the news division, and Reuters have a level of credibility in terms of the news divisions. I do want to separate. There are some like really good journalists doing really good work at both CNN and at Fox News, not in the commentary world. Um, and Reuters, of course, also has, has an international reputation. Credible. Right? But, but yes. They have their tendencies to understand, to interpret the world a little bit differently. And you see that in their headlines. Very different kinds of words, very different descriptors, all describing President Biden's actions, all showing, or all inclined toward, all preferring their own kinds of interpretation. So I know this has really been a, a cursory um, look at some of, some of the information pitfalls and information skills that, that we can encounter and use in our everyday lives. Bottom line, I would say we fall for misinformation and disinformation for a few reasons. We don't fact check. Confirmation bias and just overload. It's, it's a rabbit hole sometimes to try and check what the credible story might be. But misinformation, disinformation, um, and it's never more apparent than in a presidential election season that this is all creating confusion about basic facts and current events. It is out of control. It has led to, is leading to violence, health risks, disruption to our democratic institutions and our daily lives. And so it's dangerous. Whether, whether it's an unintentionally spread rumor or a fabricated news story. And it will take us to prevent the spread of mis- and disinformation and mitigate its harmful effects. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Terrific. Questions, please raise your hand. I have one here. Uh, when you see a logo that is, is it on? No. Mm -hmm. When you see a logo that is definitely legitimate, but the message is, is really uh, suspect, is there anybody policing um, who uses their logo? And would it help to I, tell the company or send them a screenshot of? this uh, false use of their uh, logo? That's a great question. The, the question about uh, scam information using the real logos of legitimate companies and, and businesses. Um, you know, I think they certainly have a lot of, um, there are folks who are hired specifically to monitor social media and look for social media content or, or stuff then posted or shared on social media that is trying to mimic their, um, their legitimate messages. Um, but nothing prevents anybody from taking a screenshot, copying and pasting somebody else's logo into their own email message. And, um, and that's, that's really going to be on us to report it. Um, and it could depend, too, on 
whether, like what the organization is. Certainly most organizations will have some team dedicated to fraud, to, um, to misinformation, and, um, and you'll particularly find that on, on social media. So if, if something does get shared that tries to mimic Netflix, for example, uses Netflix logo, um, you can report it to the, the social media platform and, um, and that will then be carried on, um, sent forward to, to the social media team at, at that organization. Um, it's, not, it's not as systematic as I would hope it would be and I don't know that on email folks are necessarily reporting it to the organizations. Um, if they recognize that it's fake, it's usually just reporting the spam to, to their email provider. So delete and report spam is one of the buttons in Gmail, for example, um, if, you're, if you're a Gmail user. And then from that point on, honestly, I kind of forget about it and just wait for the next one to show up. Um, because it will. <laughs> Um, so, great question. Thank you. Uh, do you believe that the amount of mis- and disinformation currently in our political scene is significantly greater than it was a decade, two decades, three decades ago, or has it really been about the same and for some reason we're just seeing it as scarier and more? I do believe the amount has increased, and the reason for that is the technology. So while misinformation and disinformation is not a new problem, the ability of our technologies to um, exacerbate its spread is new, and also the access to creating and distributing that content is also new. So. You know, everything from Benjamin Franklin's time to World War II, the broadcast era, up until really the internet became mainstream, um, the access to produce and distribute was pretty limited. You, you had to have the means, you had to have an in. And now anybody can basically do it and see if it gains traction. And once it does, it's viral. I mean, information works like a virus in the digital, digitally networked environment, and it multiplies exponentially. That's what's new about, about the misinformation, disinformation problem. Thank you. Yeah, oh. A few months ago, a university president was interpreting some information, and she said it depended on the context. And eventually, she had to leave that presidency. Any comments on that? Uh, <laughs> I, I think anybody in a position of representing an organization or institution to the public needs to be very well prepared to do that and needs to be um, needs to approach, needs to communicate with the publics with honesty and integrity, and, and also with doing due diligence to the information that they are conveying. Um, and context is all too easily left out in our current information environment because everything is snippets, short content, and we're on to the next thing. And we often don't have patience for context, but it is context that gives our information usefulness in, um, in a credible way, gives our information integrity or shows that it's not integrity information. That's my diplomatic response. <laughs> we, can, we can talk off microphone later. <laughs> well done. <laughs> so I, my um, host of my email, that company is getting scammed all the time. And so I asked 
the company to give me any of the email titles that they might be using, and they did. So that could be one solution. Um, and the question that I have is, seeing how you're so knowledgeable, have you ever gotten scammed? And would you share it with us? <laughs> I actually, um, I have not. I, I have been a, a victim of good old fashioned identity theft when my information was taken out of hospital records. Um, so, so I had that experience, um, but it was fortunately resolved. I was very lucky that it was resolved fairly easily because they weren't really bright and they were found in a Toys R Us parking lot with a lot of stuff bought with a lot of fake documents and multiple driver's licenses and all that fun stuff. Um, so, so that I have been, I have dealt with identity theft. Um, I have not lost anything to um, a, a scam. <laughs> um, there's a question, question up here. Yeah, this is just a clarification of what you said before, but when you get one of those phishing emails that purport that you had an expenditure or whatever, uh, you know, do you send it to spam or do you delete it or do you do both or well, wh how do you get rid of it? You know. So um, in in my Gmail app, yeah. you can um, you can delete and there's an option to delete and report spam in and it's not one of the obvious buttons, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a, in one of the, the little pull down icons, there's an option to, to delete and report junk or spam. And it goes, it goes into the, the junk folder, uh -huh. which then is dealt with in a different way than the standard trash. So it's delete and then report spam? Yeah, I think it's it's actually a, a single choice. Delete and report spam is the label of the option. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And it might look different if you're in the mobile app or using it in a browser on a, a laptop located in different places. And I guess I'm I can't even like visualize it right now. It's just, it's so automatic at this point. <laughs> I get a lot at the Historical Society email about some invoice that you know needed correcting, and can you click on this and double check it for us? Nope. Hi. When you get an email that's marked spam, who decides whether it's spam or not? Um, so it won't be marked spam until you mark it spam. But I don't mark it spam. It comes to me and it says spam. Okay, but yeah, potential. So, so that, that means that your email provider is, is setting, some, um, setting, setting some criteria to, to look for common, as, as the gentleman was saying earlier, um, having fairly typical or common, for example, subject lines or wonky email addresses that look like they're trying to mimic a well-known legitimate corporation. Um, there might be filters already put into your email provider's algorithms as it's receiving the mail that will mark it as potential spam. And that's, that's also how some, sometimes emails that people send us automatically end up in our junk inboxes because the provider has decided you don't want to deal with this. It's, it's junk. And then, you know, three weeks later, when somebody's like, why didn't you email me back? I don't know what you're talking about. Um, you go and you find it in your junk folder because they took care of it for you. So, so there, are, there are attempts, there are genuine attempts to help us filter all of that information into good information and, you know, threatening or dangerous information. They are trying to give us a, a heads up. They don't always get it right. But they're working on it. Anyone else? Questions? I'm looking. Oh, thank you so much, Cheryl. This was thank terrific. You. Really appreciate it. <laughs>